someone did indeed have a design for Emery. On July 29, 2005, RCMP officers arrested Emery in Halifax, where he had been attending a cannabis-related event. In a concurrent raid in Vancouver, Emery's seed business and the BC Marijuana Party office were searched by the Vancouver police on behalf of the DEA. Two Emery Seeds employees, Greg Williams and Michelle Rainey, were arrested on charges related to seed selling. The Seattle office of the DEA takes the wraps off an 18-month investigation. Agents have shut down a business accused of supplying pot growing operations in all 50 states, a bus that has triggered outrage across the border in Canada. Mark Emery would distribute high-grade marijuana seeds, as you can see, to virtually every state in the United States. Their activities resulted in the growing of thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of marijuana plants in America. Emery and two other suspects are in U.S. custody tonight, but the U.S. plans to uh, try to extradite them on drug and money laundering charges to face a potential here of life in prison. This is a Canadian citizen with an American search warrant. Federal prosecutors say Emery's arrest and search warrants at three B.C. properties were coordinated through the Canadian government. Emery is not charged in Canada, leaving authorities here in a difficult position, trying to explain why Americans can charge him and they haven't. Very often we get information, we act on it. Um, it's based on resource issues, very, uh, you know, and priority. Crown counsel refused, refused, refused to take those charges. Um, it's based on resource issues, very, uh, you know, and priority. Canadian Crown attorneys having denied the Vancouver police a prosecution of Emory in Canada, the U.S. attorney was happy to step in and prosecute him in the U.S.A. Upon Emory's arrest, DEA spokesperson Karen Tandy issued a media release. Emory, it said, had been designated as one of the Attorney General's most wanted international drug trafficking organizational targets, one of only 46 in the world and the only one from Canada. But in its glee, the DEA tipped its hand. Emory's arrest, the release said, was, quote, a significant blow not only to the marijuana trafficking trade in the U.S. and Canada, but also to the marijuana legalization movement. It continued, quote, hundreds of thousands of dollars of Emory's illicit profits are known to have been channeled to marijuana legalization groups active in the United States and Canada. Drug legalization lobbyists now have one less pot of money to rely on, unquote. The DEA was boasting, chiefly, that its actions had served political ends. Indeed, one of the most interesting things about the release was what it didn't say. It nowhere referred to Emery as a marijuana seed seller. Rather, it referred to him only as a publisher and as founder of a marijuana legalization group. The day following Emery's arrest would see protests and Emery's arrest making the national news. Why did it take the United States to arrest BC's Prince of Pot? From our national news center, Global National, here is Tara Nelson. A show of support in Vancouver for a man who has been dubbed the Prince of Pot, and for good reason. Mark Emery has worked tirelessly for years on behalf of people just like these here today. But now he needs their help. The war on drugs in America has identified a Canadian enemy, none other than Mark Emery himself. Hello and thank you for joining us. By his own admission, he has sold millions of marijuana seeds to people all over the world. Three million dollars worth a year to the U.S. alone, according to American authorities, who have issued an extradition order for Canada's best-known pot activist. Police in this country acting on America's behalf, arresting Emery in Halifax yesterday. Today, the very lengths to which the long arm of the law in the U.S. will go, raising some very serious questions. Go home, USA! Go home! It's a chant that is often heard in more volatile parts of the world. But anti-American sentiment was front and center in Vancouver after the Prince of Pot, Mark Emery, was arrested by Canadian police on behalf of American authorities. They see a change taking place here in Vancouver and they feel threatened by that because they see that culture going across the border. It's not the kind of moral crusade that it is in the United States. This has nothing to do with public health and everything to do with morality and politics and economics. The Prince of Pot is out of jail, having posted $50,000 in bail money. So the uh, the media-dubbed Prince of Pot is here, and this has been uh, certainly making news headlines across Canada and the States. The last couple of weeks have been uh, certainly uh, exciting, interesting, not dull for you. Uh, released from jail just yesterday, in fact, on $50,000 
bail. Uh, arrested in Halifax last week at the request of the U.S. authorities and uh, alleged charges including conspiring to manufacture marijuana, distribute marijuana and launder money, and now uh, an extradition hearing into the States. And some pretty serious stuff. I mean, a minimum charge there of, of 10 years behind bars. Mark, well, let's, not let's talk they, about they this. They want me to be in prison for the rest of my life. I think your issue is putting the idea of Canadian sovereignty into the spotlight. People are saying, why should the Americans be allowed to come up here and, and go after someone like Emery in terms of extradition? For supporters of Mark Emery, it's become an issue of Canadian sovereignty. Well, I think it's a direct challenge to Canada's sovereignty. I think that there really is a question, is Canada going to uh, send Canadian citizens to prison for life in the United States? It's very difficult to escape the perception that this bust was orchestrated by America, that we have at least given something of our sovereignty uh, to the U.S. Well, this is a good example of the complete lack of perspective in these things. I mean, what is the harm being done? I mean, if Americans want to who, uh, say marijuana is a bad thing, that, that's fine, but they're, they're treading on thin ice. But treading with massive political clout and with no hesitation to use it against Canadian citizens like Mark Emery. I think they should stay in their own country. This is Canada. That's the United States. Keep your own laws down there. I don't agree with what he's done, but if he hasn't broken a law in this country, I think it's kind of scary if we start extradating people that aren't guilty of a crime here. And that's one thing I will say that this, this incident has brought out. I have never had so many people. See, the two big things I always wanted to achieve that I could never get done is worldwide unity for our movement. Right, mm -hmm. which this seems to have done in a nice way, so that's good. And secondly, getting the people who don't smoke pot to give a damn. How do we get those people? I always thought, I can get the pot people to give a damn, but I can't get the people who don't smoke. Well, now they give a damn, because they're seeing, wow, they just came in and grabbed a guy. Were you totally blindsided in Halifax when RCMP, again acting on the U.S. authorities' request, arrested you last week? Did that come out of nowhere for you? No, all my life I've been fated for this unique destiny. I felt very, very... Uh, motivated to this end since I was very very young but the thing is it's a calling you know 30 years ago I decided that you know I was being chosen in a kind of like a mythological way to do this for people it's always been my destiny to do this and it's been my destiny probably to go to jail for this I am looking forward to my confrontation with the US government. I've always thought of them as my arch enemy, just like out of the comic books I read when I grew up, you know, your arch enemy, and you know, it's a very comic book term, but the United States government and the DEA represent all the things I spent my whole life opposing, so I'm glad I've got this really big, colossal battle uh, coming up, because it sort of suits the comic book image I have of myself and of life generally. I believe the DEA would be, it's not in their nature to let me out alive, because I represent like the allied forces that are allied against them. And if I win, that means their $2 billion budget is over, all those people are unemployed, the DEA goes out of business. So it's either me or them, ultimately. And I kind of like the David and Goliath aspect to that. So again, it's, it's, it's my comic book life is following me right to my destiny at the end. You have to be a little bit concerned, scared. What, what are you no. feeling? You say you'll I've go been, to jail for this, you'll be a marijuana martyr. Yeah, yeah. that would, could perhaps be the greatest honor I could ever have asked for. Now, I don't want to do that. I want people to get together and galvanize this movement around the world and rally behind me, not so much to save me, but to be aware that there are hundreds of thousands. You know, there's a quarter million people in jail at any one time around the world for marijuana. A beautiful God-given plant that God bequeathed to his children here on earth that doesn't hurt anybody. I'm, I'm talking about an oppressed class of people, of millions of people, that were, say, were being saved and being represented by the use of my money and I was being an instrument and a tool for this great revolution and I felt that this is my unique destiny and okay. this, is, this is what I have to accept. Millions of seeds and dollars. According to police, the mail order website raked in almost three million dollars a year. But business is taking a hit today because this website is shut down. The court having ordered the closure of Emory's seed business, Emory no longer had the financial resources to fund legalization campaigns around the globe on a grand scale. But it was too late for that to matter. So now the shoe has dropped. Now the Goliath, now the evil empire has finally made its move on me. And now I can confront the enemy face to face. I have been giving interviews with the New York Times, with all the Canadian national media, and I will be doing radio interviews every day. I will be talking to television every day. I will be receiving your letters and your words of support every day. I am not reducing the amount of 
energy and commitment and devotion I put to this movement, I will be doubling that effort. There is no backtracking. There is no going back on what I have done. The revolution is fully engaged and I am fully cognizant of my responsibility to continuing it no matter where I may be. If I one day end up in a federal penitentiary, I will continue the battle however and wherever and in whatever manner I can do it. I am never going to retire. I am never going to stop. It is till liberty or till death. What's next for you? Well, I'm going to keep battling away and doing my work every day. I work seven days a week. I want to get marijuana legalized. That's the only thing that's important to me. If I go to jail for the rest of my life in two years because Canadians are willing to sacrifice me, that's the way it goes. It are doesn't you scared? No. You're not? No. Not in American prison? Nothing scary? No. No, it, prison rape, getting beat up, all those things, they'll come. It's, that's just the price you have to pay. If you want to accomplish something worthwhile, and after all, if anybody could do this job, anybody would be doing it, but nobody's doing it. I'm unique in this way. I've always been the leader of this movement for many years across the world, and I'm going to get marijuana legalized, and it doesn't matter if it kills me. I thank you. Okay. The seeds of Emery's fame and of his marijuana movement had been planted. The police could kill a business, but they could not kill Emery's reputation, message, or influence. In fact... Emery's fame and influence continued to increase. In the months following his arrest, Emery's cannabis culture and overgrow-the-government materials could be found in HBO's hit series Weeds. Meanwhile, back in London, which had never stopped keeping tabs on its son, Emery was feted in a new play titled Citizen Mark, and on January 27, 2006, London gave Emery a hero's welcome home as he viewed the gala opening of the play. He, uh, he stands by his convictions. He believes what he believes sincerely and wholeheartedly, and I think we can learn a lot from that. The play's been getting great reviews. It was wonderful to go to my hometown and have all the media put me on their talk shows for an hour and, and squire me about the city and give me a front page treatment in the London Free Press on the Saturday and uh, terrific reviews in all the newspapers, and it was really wonderful. It's kind of an interesting, slim, shady experience seeing a guy who kind of looks like you play you, speak your lines, speak your words, behave with the same passion that I always had and uh, I loved every minute of it. A few weeks later, on March 5th, 2006, Emery became the subject of one of the most important news programs on television, 60 Minutes. His name is Mark Emery and he's called the Prince of Pot. Well, no one's ever gone to jail for selling seeds in Canada and only two people in 35 years have even been charged. The most recent person fined for selling seeds in the year 2000 received a $200 fine. Prison, how long? Well, he faces... Uh, uh, conceivably up to life in prison. I am blessed by what the DEA has done. I'd rather see marijuana legalized than me being saved from a U.S. jail. Your, your language is pretty much that of a martyr. It's, um, the language I like to use is one of a person, a leader, who's confident and prepared to accept the punishment that noble purpose will bring about. Larry Campbell, a Canadian senator who formerly served on the drug squad of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, is well aware of Mark Emery. What would the public reaction be here if Mark Emery is extradited to the States? I think there'd be, uh, I think that there'd be outrage. As of the spring of 2010, Emery still has not been extradited, and over the five years since his arrest, he has continued his activism full force. So the DEA once again, and the United States government, and the Canadian government have failed. Because when the DEA raided me on July 29th, they said they wanted to put me out of business. I'm pleased to announce that that business is out of business, effective today. I'm not out of business. There's still a hundred people selling seeds all across Canada, so if you want seeds, they're out there. You don't have to look far. There are more seed businesses out there than ever before. So that hasn't stopped. And my magazine's coming out. It's coming out in 10 days. We're shipping next week the latest issue of Cannabis Culture Magazine. It's beautiful. It's got 34 pages alone, juicy pages, all about growing pot, beautiful bud shots. It's the most beautiful issue I've ever been involved with. It's fabulous. We're shipping it next week. Our advertisers, we have more advertisers than ever before. And we've got seven days to go before the U.S. election on Tuesday, November 7th. You've got to get out to vote. You can see a list. I'm not kidding. It's taken me six months to do this to put together a profile of all 435 U.S. federal districts. You can find out who to vote for senator, who's good for the cannabis culture. So what's the last couple of years been like for you? Oh, well, I've been very pleasant. I've enjoyed the time with my wife. We've gotten our magazine to a worldwide stage. I've managed to keep our activism you know, on the largest scale it's ever been. And if anything, you know, I've gotten a lot of A-list media interviews with 60 Minutes, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Australian Broadcast Service. 
with the media continuing to regard him as the world's most noteworthy and quote-worthy leader of the marijuana legalization movement, Emery has worked tirelessly to turn public opinion against prohibition and to normalize the cannabis culture. And public polls suggest that he, as the dominant proponent of marijuana legalization, has had considerable success. When he opened his bookstore, City Lights, in 1975, polling suggested that only 25% of Canadians favored legalization. By 2007, polls were consistently showing that the majority of Canadians favored the legalization of marijuana. In Canada, support for legalization is now normal. Emery's arrest coincided with a political revolution in Canada that would change the political context in which his extradition would be considered. The marijuana and same-sex marriage developments of 2003 happened while Canada was being governed by Liberals. The Conservatives at that time were staunchly opposed to the decriminalization of marijuana and were promising that a Conservative government would introduce a free vote on restoring the prohibition of same-sex marriage. In July of 2005, the month Emery was arrested on U.S. charges, a Liberal bill to recognize same-sex marriages was brought into force. However, in November of 2005, a scandal involving the illegal use of taxpayer dollars caused the fall of the Paul Martin Liberal government. The Liberals' marijuana decriminalization bill died as Parliament was dissolved and a January election called. Low voter support for the Liberals created an electoral vacuum just barely strong enough to pull the Conservative Party of Stephen Harper into power, with the smallest minority in Canada's history. Well, we have a new Conservative government in Canada that, to our American friends, is like a Republican government. It's fundamentalist-inspired, it's uh, considered right-wing Conservative. So now, we have a party that's, the Conservative Party is opposed to legalizing or decriminalizing marijuana. They want more penalties for the possession of marijuana, and they want mandatory jail sentences for those caught growing marijuana and those found selling marijuana. So this is quite a change towards a more extreme and draconian punishment system here in Canada. The Conservative Party is greatly influenced by the United States Bush administration. Stephen Harper, the new Prime Minister, considers himself a very good friend to the Republican Party. So superficially we have our work cut out for us with what would appear to be a much more hostile government to our plans of reform. Now in government, the Conservatives would attempt to turn back the clock on the cultural and legal developments of 2003. In December of 2006, Conservative MP Rob Nicholson then Minister of Democratic Reform, brought a motion that the House of Commons call upon the government to introduce legislation that would put an end to same-sex marriages. By that time, the public thought it wrong to ban same-sex marriages. The motion failed, and, much to the chagrin of its religious, social conservative base, the Conservatives gave up on the same-sex marriage issue. The cannabis culture would not be so lucky. In January of 2007, one month after bringing the failed motion to ban same-sex marriage, Nicholson got a promotion. He now would be Canada's Justice Minister. On October 4, 2007, at the headquarters of the Salvation Army, Harper announced the Conservative government's new national drug strategy. Of the $63 million in funding announced today, two-thirds is aimed at the social aspect. What we are up against in trying to resolve this problem, what the police are up against, those who deal in treatment and prevention are up against, is a culture. What we are against the culture, but what we are up against is a culture that since the 1960s has, at the minimum, not encouraged drug use and often romanticized it. Romanticized it or made it uh, cool, made it acceptable. And look, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, as a father, I don't, uh, I don't say all these things blamelessly. You know, I, my son is uh, listening to my Beatles records and asking me what all these lyrics mean. And, um, you know, it's, it's just there. It's out there. I love these records. Uh, I'm not putting them away. But that said, the reality is that uh, there has been a culture that has not fought drug use, and that's what we're all up against. Um, no uh, easy solutions to that, but we have seen, in the case of tobacco, a shift in the culture in a way that has rendered tobacco use less and less uh, socially or culturally acceptable. Um, I think we need to do the same thing. In fact, we need to do it much uh, much more quickly and much more critically in the area of uh, in the area of narcotics. Emery appeared on Mike Duffy's national political broadcast to respond to Harper's announcement. And Mark Emery is the publisher of Cannabis Culture magazine. So, Mark, I can just imagine, uh, but let me hear it from you. Your reaction uh, to well, what the uh, government's announced today. Uh, 250,000 people in Canada alone are in the marijuana industry. Uh, you've got hundreds of thousands. <laughs> 
thousands of people who sell these drugs, and now they're all at risk of going to jail. And Mr. Day was talking about federal time, which means a minimum of two years mandatory minimums. We don't even have mandatory minimums for violent crimes in this country. And let me remind you that these drug transactions between human beings are consenting actions between adults. Uh, Judy Lalam, what, what happens when you hear this kind of an argument? I mean, well, school kids don't know what they're getting into when they're getting hooked on crack and this kind of stuff. You know, millions of Canadians, and I certainly mean millions of Canadians, drink alcohol. And this is, and you know, the president of Molson Breweries isn't being arrested under this program. They advertise. Could tobacco manufacturers are still not being sent to jail for all the people they kill. I mean, alcohol kills 10,000 Canadians a year, tobacco 40,000 Canadians, prescription drugs 22,000 Canadians, et cetera, et cetera. None of those people are going to be going to jail or accounting for the people they kill. Marijuana doesn't kill anybody. Five million Canadians smoke it. We're entitled to do so. We're adults in a so-called free society. And Prime Minister Harper is sorely mistaken if he thinks that this is appropriate government policy in a free society. It isn't. We should end prohibition. But if we put money into prevention, and treatment prevention works. We've seen it in every other avenue in life, in helmet helmet laws and seatbelt laws and in fire prevention and, and other and injury worked, prevention. It's, it's done it pretty well work. in cigarette smoking as well. So anyway, exactly. I thank you both for joining us. Cigarette dealers don't go to jail, I notice though. <laughs> uh, thank you both for joining us. We'll be back when this package actually comes before the house and we see the specific details. Fifteen months later. Prime Minister Harper appointed Mike Duffy to the Senate. Emory and the cannabis culture were in the Conservative government's sights, and in November of 2007, the Conservatives introduced a bill that would introduce mandatory minimum sentences for marijuana growing offenses, except where the grower had opted to enter into treatment for marijuana dependency. The Harper government had adopted a trick from their U.S. Republican brothers. Of the six million people who could benefit from treatment and need it in the United States today, 60% are dependent on marijuana. Most people then went, a lot of them, to a drug court. And the drug court says, well, we can try and save you from a record. We won't put you in jail, but um, we'll put you into treatment. Well, they're in treatment because of the structure. In January of 2008, Emery announced that he had agreed to a plea deal. The Canadian Prosecutorial Service, the United States Justice Department, and my lawyers are setting about to negotiate uh, an agreement whereby I would serve time in custody in exchange for the release of my co-accused Michelle and Greg. I just thought my country would regard me as a Canadian citizen and judge me before a Canadian jury under Canadian law with a Canadian uh, a judge and peers, but I'm getting none of that. I'm being sent off to the United States, but I wouldn't get a trial here, I wouldn't get a jury here, I wouldn't get a Canadian judge to listen to the facts as to the case, so ultimately I w I'm being outsourced to the American judicial system. Mark Emery has reached a deal with U.S. officials to plead guilty over his internet sales of marijuana seeds. Emery says U.S. prosecutors offered a 10-year prison term. That would mean he would have to spend at least five years in prison, most of it here in Canada. So what do you think about this deal? Well, it's a necessary deal in order to save my two co-accused, Michelle Rainey. She has Crohn's disease. She would have a very painful time in jail. And Greg Williams, these are two true believers who are activists with me who should not spend any time in jail. And the United States uh, has offered something in writing that I'm prepared to accept, even though it's outrageous. These two parties, the Republican Party of the United States and the Conservative Party in Canada, have very much become axes of evil of North America. And they are, in fact, collaborating to undermine the sovereignty of perhaps both countries, but certainly of Canada. So I have to waive my right to an appeal, waive my right to an early release, even though I haven't harmed anybody at all and there's no victim at all. But it's a very punitive offer. I'm not allowed to own the magazine anymore. I have to be penniless when I report to jail. I have to report to jail immediately upon accepting this, this deal. And it's not like I own a lot now. The only thing I really own in the whole world is this magazine. You give up the magazine. Yeah. Which is <laughs> well, it's my life. Well, it's not so much what it's worth. It's not worth a lot financially, but it's been going on for 14 years, and it's my baby, and it's worth a lot to the movement. You know, it's open season on marijuana activists and the marijuana people, and we see this in both the Bush administration and the Harper administration in Ottawa. So, you know, I'm between a rock and a hard place, trying to save people, trying to represent the movement, trying to uh, do the right thing. The deal required the approval of Justice Minister Rob Nicholson's prosecutorial department. Inexplicably. That approval was refused. The effect of the Canadian government's refusal was that if Emery was going to serve time, he would have to serve it in an American prison. By the summer of 2009, Emery had entered into a plea deal with the U.S. prosecuting attorney. If the Canadian justice minister decided to extradite Emery, Emery and the U.S. attorney would both ask a sentencing judge for a five-year prison sentence. Emery accepted the deal 
because as part of the deal, the U.S. attorney would also agree to a sentence of just two years of probation served in Canada for each of Emery's employees, Greg Williams and Michelle Rainey. In the summer of 2009, Williams and Rainey were sentenced to two years probation in Canada, and Emery conducted a cross-country, 30-city speaking tour, which he called his farewell tour. Well, there's 32 cities that we're going to all of the summer. We've been to Calgary, Banff, Lethbridge, and Saskatoon, next door at Edmonton here today, and we're doing a new city every day for the next two weeks, only three days off this month. For and, our but do people, are they... Well, the people who come out are obviously people who support what I'm saying, and they're giving me a lot of love. Well, good luck on your tour, and thanks for joining us Well, today. thank you very much. Thank you. On September 19th, 2009, the marijuana movement held a free Mark Emery rally in 130 cities around the globe, including Toronto, Birmingham, Alabama, Copenhagen, and Berlin. On September 28, 2009, Emery held a press conference at the courthouse in Vancouver. Although he had not yet been convicted of anything, he would thereafter be transferred to a maximum security prison to await the decision of Justice Minister Rob Nicholson concerning his extradition. Love you, Mark. Oh, hey. oh, thank you, everyone, for coming here. My last days as a free person here in Vancouver and... As a Canadian being sent abroad to the United States uh, for an activity I did here in Vancouver openly and transparently and proudly, I, I have to say I'm disappointed in my government. I'm proud of everything I've done. I don't feel bad about anything. I won't be repentant. I won't be apologizing to any judge. I won't be uh, making account for my work. I'll only regret that I wasn't able to do more. The Justice Minister is going to have to sign off on my extradition. Tell him, don't do it. It's a betrayal of everything Canadian. It's a betrayal of our sovereignty. It's a betrayal of a good citizen myself who's never hurt anybody. There's no victim here. I love you, Mark. I love you, Mark. This is a win Devastated. But I'm furious. Our Canadian government is abandoning Canadians abroad and sending Canadian citizens, like my husband, to a foreign country to be punished under severe laws. My husband never went to the United States to sell these seeds. The Vancouver police investigated Mark here for selling the seeds, and the court said it's not worth prosecuting. Nobody would care about that. So the Vancouver police gave the information to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration and said, get this man and punish him in your country where we know it will be a worse punishment. And that's why they came after him and said, we want three indictments with mandatory minimums of 10 years each. That was 30 years minimum up to life that my husband was facing in U.S. prison. So to be forced into taking this five-year plea deal, at least I'll see him again alive. But everybody needs to know, this conservative government had the chance over a year ago to sentence Mark to a term in Canada. The Americans said Mark can stay in Canada if the Canadian government sentences him there. And the Conservatives refused. They abandoned Mark. They're sending him south. They abandoned Canadians all over the world. And people should be furious about this. I've been crying endlessly, but now I'm angry. And everybody should be angry. I'll bring my husband back home to me, please. Take a good look at the drug war, America. Take a good look at your war on drugs. Beginning September 28, 2009, Emery was held in the maximum security North Fraser Pretrial Center. As had been the case in Saskatoon, his supporters held vigil outside the prison for the duration of his incarceration. Supporters of marijuana activist Mark Emery aren't giving up their fight to win his freedom. They have gathered outside the North Fraser Pretrial Center in Port Coquitlam. His supporters say his extradition is an outrage and they vow to hold a vigil every day until he's released. We have people all over the world who are upset about him being put in jail for selling seeds from Canada. And every day from this point on, we're going to have at least two people sitting vigil outside the prison here. So Mark knows that there's support, so everybody passing by knows that he's here. And we can start to petition the Justice Minister to ensure he doesn't get extradited. And Emery communicated with the cannabis culture via recorded telephone messages, which were published online as Emery's Prison Podcast. The podcasts revealed in Emory a wide range of emotions, from defiant anger... Canada, as we've known it, tolerant, democratic, safe, and relatively free, is at great risk of being lost. So what can you do? 
Get off your ass and assert yourself as a citizen. Go out and make a difference. Remember, I did this from an 8 foot by 10 foot jail cell, every word of it. So out there, you can do a lot. To calm reassurance. Uh, I've been rereading I Have a Dream writings and speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. because his eloquence and brilliant thoughts keep me from kind of getting sad in these challenging times behind bars. To the crippling pit of despair. This lonely, desolate place, this maximum security institution. Can you imagine a person like me in a maximum security institution in an 8 by 10 cell, concrete cell, 20 hours a day, scribbling away, writing away? I'm so very lonely. And, while Emery suffered in darkness and hunger, in a cramped 8 foot by 10 foot cage, Prime Minister Harper took to the stage with high society to romanticize the very culture for which Emery was imprisoned. Yet there in October with Stephen Harper in October 2009 playing piano and singing along with the National Arts Gallery to I Get a High with a Little Help from My Friends, a Beatles song that Paul McCartney and John Lennon were inspired to write after a night of marijuana use. But what we are up against is a culture that since the 1960s has at the minimum not encouraged drug use and often romanticized. Released on bail on November 18, 2009, while he awaited the decision of the Justice Minister concerning his extradition, Emery was able to prepare as thousands of people from around the world converged on Vancouver for the 2010 Winter Olympics. And when they arrived, the world lined up outside of Mark Emery's Cannabis Culture headquarters to meet with Emery, to be photographed smoking marijuana with Emery, Weed. and to sit and smoke marijuana in his vapor lounge on the third floor. The wait list, three hours long. If anything, Emery's two-month imprisonment had made him even more famous. The week of March 15, 2010, brought Mark Emery and the marijuana legalization issue to the Prime Minister's doorstep. On March 15, 2010, elected members from all three of Canada's major political parties, including a member of the Conservative Party, each tendered petitions signed by a total of 12,000 Canadians calling upon the Justice Minister not to surrender Emery to the United States. Um, I'm presenting a petition today, uh, quite a large petition as you can see from the pile on the table beside me, uh, regarding Mark Emery, the uh, leader of the British Columbia Marijuana Party. And uh, the petitioners uh, call on Parliament to make it clear to the Minister of Justice that such an extradition should be opposed. So I'm very pleased to present this. I think it's a very strong uh, reflection of uh, Canadians' view on this matter. I believe um, you know, uh, there is a certain degree of unfairness that's inherent in the process that's, um, that's been used to deal with him. And, um, and while I come from British Columbia, a former Attorney General and a former Premier of British Columbia, I have certain sympathies with Mr. Emery, not because of what he did, but because I believe that the process that was used uh, to arrest him and punish him but wouldn't have been done in the case of Canadian authorities wanting to arrest him and punish him. And I believe that because of that unfairness, the Minister of Justice is urged by the petitioners to take another look at it. One week prior, the Prime Minister had agreed to a March 16th appearance on YouTube and promised to answer the most popular questions put to him by the YouTube audience. In what must have been a shocking discovery for the Prime Minister, the top four questions put to the Prime Minister called upon him to legalize marijuana. The last question that we have today uh, was the question that was passed with the most votes, and it's about marijuana. Oh, really? It was the question with the most votes. Uh, tackled the subject of marijuana. And it, it is written as follows. A, a majority of Canadians, when polled, say they believe marijuana should be legal for adults uh, just, like tax, uh, just like alcohol. Why don't you end the war on drugs and focus on violent criminals? When people are buying from the drug trade, they are not buying from their neighbor. They are buying from international cartels mm -hmm. that are involved in unimaginable violence uh, and intimidation and social disaster and catastrophe all across the world, all across the world. Um, you know, and I just wish people would understand that, and not just on drugs. Even when people buy, you know, an illegal carton of cigarettes and they avoid tax, that they really understand the kind of criminal networks that they are supporting, supporting. and the damage they do. Now, you know, I know some people say if you just legalized it, uh, you know, you'd get the money and, and, and all would be well. But I, I think that rests on the assumption that somehow 
drugs are bad because they're illegal. The reason drugs, it's not that. The reason drugs are illegal is because they are bad. On April 15th, 2010, the 70-year-old Jack Harar, author of the book that caused Emery to be involved in the marijuana movement, passed away while recovering from a heart attack that he had suffered months earlier. And as Emery and others mourn his death, the Justice Minister approaches a May 10th deadline for the making of a decision about whether or not to extradite Mark Emery to the United States of America.